It's now time to hear a bit more about how Luminous funding will be utilized at the campus level. So I want to turn uh, things over to our good friend, Elizabeth Pauley, the Associate Vice President at the Boston Foundation, who will lead a panel of distinguished campus leaders whose institutions are receiving uh, a first set of Lumina grants. After introducing our campus colleagues, I'm going to ask Elizabeth to briefly describe the Boston Foundation's efforts as a Lumina Foundation Talent Hub side, site. Elizabeth? Thank you, Commissioner. The Boston Foundation is delighted to be joining the Massachusetts Equity Institution's work and to work as a community partner with the presidents you see before you. Uh, they are all overseeing Equity Institution campus grants and they are as brilliant as they are succinct in our speed round conversation. Um, we have with us today Pam Edinger, the president of Bunker Hill Community College. We have Fred Clark, the president of Bridgewater State University. We have Eve Salomon Fernandez, the president of Greenfield Community College. We have Christina Royal, the president of Holyoke Community College. Kimberly Pinder, the president of the Massachusetts College of Art and Design. And Marcelo Suarez Orozco, the chancellor of the University of Massachusetts, Boston. Welcome all. Today's focus on racial equity in post-secondary completion is both timely and long overdue. As other speakers have noted, against the dual backdrop of the pandemic and the racial justice movement, the imperative to address these racial and ethnic disparities has become even greater, and the task has become more challenging. Today's conversation builds on the long-term work that the Boston Foundation has been a partner in through Success Boston. Success Boston is Boston's citywide college completion initiative. Together with the mayor's office, the public schools, institutions of higher education, nonprofits, and employers, Success Boston works to answer the call. Do better for all students. Through coaching and other campus activities, we have made great strides in increasing college success among Boston's graduates. In fact, we've seen a 78% increase in the number of college completers, and every subgroup of student has made gains. That's thousands more students equipped with the skills they will need and the entry ticket for a thriving career. But our work is far from done. We continue to face persistent gaps in college completion by both race and gender. Black and Latinx students are still the least likely to graduate from high school, enroll in post-secondary, and complete a college degree. And I cannot state this forcefully enough. The flaw lies not with them, but with the system. Higher education was simply not built for the black and brown students of today. And unfortunately, that means it is ill-suited for the majority of students on our campuses, particularly at community colleges. So advancing racial equity in higher education in our state requires us to change the system while also building students' ability to navigate the current one so that no one falls through the cracks. Lumina has been a longtime partner to us in this work and has supported efforts to strengthen community colleges, to rally community, and has designated us as a talent hub community. Together, we have started changing the system while building students' ability to navigate the current one. And through the individual institutions efforts that you'll hear about in a moment, and combined with the leadership of the department, I'm certain we can rise to this challenge. And that's what gives me hope today. So with that, I would like to invite our brilliant leaders into this speed round conversation, and I'll start with you, President Ediger. At the center of your work is the acknowledgement that the cultural wealth that students of color bring to campus and to the classroom is critically, critically important. How do you operationalize this into the day-to-day -day work and culture of campus life, and what lessons can we draw from it to accelerate the statewide work? One of the hardest things to change are hearts and minds. And in order for us to truly be equitable, it is not just policies and procedures or um, putting dollars into a program. It really is changing the hearts and minds and the narrative for every single person who touches a student. Instead of looking at our students with a deficit lens, we must see our students as sources of social and, 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 and economic connections for our workforce. 
And those things are at the heart of our Center for Equity and Cultural Wealth that we've had in existence for three years. Um, we weave those values into teaching and learning. Um, curriculum is look through those lenses of cultural relevancy. Our co-curricular activities happens out in the community. Um, we need to know who our students are. And unless you know who the students are and believe that they have the potential to reach, um, no amount of rhetoric is going to change the system. So we, we do, we, um, we call each other on it uh, every day in the work that we do. And hopefully we will fight this old fight with a new narrative that there is wealth in, at the heart of our students and that's what we should be developing. Thank you. President Clark, I'll turn to you next. Bridgewater State University is home to Leading for Change, a coalition of campuses collaborating towards pedagogy and teaching that is grounded in racial equity and anti-racism. What emerging lessons can you share from that collaboration that might advance this work? Elizabeth, thank you and Boston Foundation and our special guests and Lumina, Commissioner Santiago, Secretary Pizer, and all of your staffs for your leadership and support. All of us here at Bridgewater are truly honored and inspired to be a part of the statewide effort. But to, for, to your question, to really ensure focus, first and foremost, you must commit yourself and your campus to the success of all students. All means all. In your strategic plan, goals, objectives should clearly reflect that priority. Second, we must then hold ourselves accountable as an institution and as a group of institutions. Finally, we must be humble and honest enough to realize that we can always do better than we're currently doing. At Bridgewater, my first set of student success-oriented actions as president was to establish institutional structures that would survive a single presidency. I created a division of student success and diversity led by Dr. Sabrina Gentle Warrior. We put diversity, inclusion, and equity at the cabinet table, empowered to make change. Our board of trustees, led by our chair, Jean Durgan, created a student success committee. I highly recommend it. That's where we report out and hold our campus accountable. Enduring and empowered structures operating within a campus culture, unafraid to measure aspects of student success that we may have failed to measure until now are all elements of accountability. But the heart of this work is our commitment to the success of all students. At Bridgewater, we have a saying that motivates our efforts, success for every student, one student at a time. Since we realize that not all students arrive at our campuses on an equal learning plane, it is essential that we engage in data informed wise practices intended to support educational equity for all while remediating educational gaps premised on or in systemic racism. And this requires listening to our black and brown students to learn about their experience and the ways in which implicit and explicit racism affects their campus and community experience. I have personally found that truly listening to the experiences of our students is the most important factor in holding ourselves tangibly accountable. But it also means that we must remain humble and open to learning. For example, our most recent campus climate survey at Bridgewater indicated that our students of color already feel as welcome as their white peers. But qualitative research also showed us that Bridgewater has extensive work to do to ensure that our black and brown students are as supported at Bridgewater as their white peers. We have work to do. And this work requires the entire campus to be engaged in the effort. Not a, not a section, but the entire campus from faculty, teaching in classrooms, to students serving offices, to maintainers who are often looked at or looked to as second parents by many of our students. This year, our entire campus is engaged in in-depth work on ways Bridgewater can become an anti-racism leader in higher education. The model of a learning community committed to intentional action on behalf of racial equity and justice also informs something we're very proud of here at Bridgewater, and that is the Leading for Change Racial Equity and Justice Consortium. There are currently 25 campuses in the consortium from the region, community colleges, four-year publics, and an array of private institutions. And they work together monthly, completing a curriculum intended to help all member campuses identify racial equity, equity gaps and fearlessly address them. BSU and the Leading for Change campuses understand that by eliminating racial educational equity gaps, we serve our mission. We help to meet the enrollment crisis facing our campuses. But most importantly, we finally become those shining cities upon a hill that the public look to for real leadership. 
Horace Mann, who helped found Bridgewater State, famously said it at a speech right here on this campus, that education is the great equalizer, the balance wheel of the social machinery. And through the commissioner's equity agenda, funding from the Lumina Foundation and others, and intentional work for educational racial equity, we are closer to that ideal than ever before. Thank you so much. Thank you, President Clark. Um, next, I'd like to turn to President Pinder. So mass art is unique uh, in this conversation as the country's only public art and design institution. So could you say a little about what do racial justice efforts look like in your unique setting? Um, yes, I can. Um, I also would like to reiterate that uh, MassArt is incredibly honored to be a part of this initiative and to be recognized by Lumina uh, in terms of the ways in which we have um, really addressed um, the inequities that we see in education, especially the graduation gaps. Uh, and I also want to say that I also like history, um, as um, Representative Presley does, Senator Presley. And what is really great about Mass Art is to say a little bit about its history. So, being a state institution, a state art and design school, really came about uh, from going back to 1870. So, in May, we just celebrated the 150th anniversary of the Drawing Act here in the Commonwealth. And what's really interesting about this drawing act, one of the main things that it was uh, focusing on was to provide free drawing instruction. It was a bill that was to provide free drawing instruction uh, to anyone over 15 years old in any town in the Commonwealth that had over 10,000 people in it. And when you look at this, um, the whole document from that year of bills, it's really sandwiched in between Fitchburg's uh, railroad construction, making sure to protect fisheries in Buzzer Bay, and also to um, incorporate a bank um, in Boston. And when you look at that and you see that a drawing act, a, a requirement that there be free instruction of drawing sandwiched in between all of those other things that you may think are normal for um, you know, the legislature to, to decide on and to mandate. And I think that really says a lot about Massachusetts and also how 150 years ago it was recognized that art and creativity were key drivers for the economy and really important for the industries that are key and central to Massachusetts. And so the point then three years later in 1873 that bill led to the founding of MassArt as an actual formal uh, public education um, institution focusing on that type of education for our citizens of the Commonwealth. And even today, um, creativity, problem solving, and critical thinking are at the top of um, the uh, skill sets that most industries, not just art and design, but most industries uh, want in their employees. And that was recognized, of course, um, over 150 years ago when this bill was created to, to found mass art. So I think that it's really important to see that as now we're moving into um, a place where getting these skill sets for everyone is really important. And that's where I see where mass art comes into play now 150 years later where they are uh, are we have 30 percent of our students um, identify as black and Latin, latinx and uh, when we move into our majors for the design industries following our history um, those numbers even get larger up to 41 percent of the students who are in those majors are black and latinx so here we have a place where uh, we are able to offer to citizens of the Commonwealth, anyone, um, to get an art and design education that if you look at the private schools, and I taught at one for 16 years in Chicago, you're looking at a, an education that costs upwards of $50,000. And we're offering it to anyone who is a citizen of Massachusetts for as low as most of our students with aid pay about $9,000 a year yeah. for this 
education using our amazing facilities, um, the type of facilities that you would find at a private art and design school. And so that's where I see that that opportunity that's offered to anyone who has the um, a talent, the ability to apply for, to mass art, to get that type of education that then still, as we were designed to fuel the jobs in the art and design industries in Massachusetts, we still do. Yeah. So we were created for that and we still do that for the state of Massachusetts. Okay. Uh, I also wanted to mention that because of our uh, student population and our efforts for retention, um, we have a new office called the Justice, Equity and Transformation Office that is led by Dean, Dean Hualai, uh, Lisa Hualai, who has also been a important member and leader of our Compass program that has been around for 20 years that is focused on helping first generation students and students of color um, with sort of wraparound supports so they can continue to be successful once they get into mass art. We Great. also have Art with Bound, which is a um, early college program that has been around for 10 years. Yeah. And that is bringing students uh, from the Boston Public Schools into uh, when they're in high school to also get art and design education. And those students, 97% of them go on to apply to college. So Thank you, President Pender, I apologize. I, I have to jump in so that we can go out west. Um, I wish we could, I wanna learn more about all of these this work on campuses. And luckily that's what this work will allow us to do as it goes on. Apologies for jumping in. But I do wanna hear um, from President Royal um, it, we are we're running short on time, but I would love to hear about how you leverage the wealth of assets within your diverse community as you shape racial equity efforts on campus. Yeah, thank you. At Holyoke Community College, our mission is to educate, inspire, and connect our students is grounded in our purpose to be for and of the community. And we have the distinct pleasure of residing in a city where 50% of our residents are Latinx. In order to leverage these assets, we utilize data to assess our own progress. An example of this reinvestment is in our Alana Men in Promotion program. Alana is a support program for young men of color, and it provides participants with personalized attention and support with their academics, financial aid, and academic and career at planning. The data shows that HCC Latinx students participating in Alana had a fall to fall retention rate of 75% compared to a rate of 45% for Latinx students not participating in Alana. There's also a great deal of research to show that mentorship has had positive academic benefits for students of color. So we're building an HCC Champions Mentorship Network, which will build off an initiative we started in fall of 2019 that connects our learners of color with alumni, friends within our greater community and fellow students. Inviting the community into HCC to support our students of color not only facilitates the formation of meaningful connections that will benefit students post-graduation, but also allows us to leverage the strengths of our community. And we had a kickoff for a deeply immersive workshop on equity-mindedness to educate our faculty and staff to identify and support necessary reforms to modify our curriculum, policies, and procedures. And Lastly, we're also co-creating our racial equity priorities with our students, faculty, staff, and community stakeholders. It's a complex topic and we need to treat it as such. Some of the greatest assets are the lived experiences of our students and employees of color, even when these experiences also consist of painful memories. In order to heal, we need to share these stories and be heard. So this fall semester, I started a series called Black Student Lives Matters, where we invite black students to share their personal stories with our board of trustees. Their stories consists of whatever parts of their background they feel comfortable sharing, as well as experiences at HCC and their educational journeys. Leveraging the cultural wealth is critical to moving the equity agenda forward. Indeed, 
the future of our communities depend on it. Thank you so much. Um, I, we're, we are a little bit over, but it's so, um, this conversation is so rich that I really do want to make sure we hear um, from Greenfield Community College and from the new kid on the block. Um, but why don't we, uh, why don't we save uh, the new chancellor for last and we'll um, go now to President Solomon Fernandez. Um, Greenfield Community College's student population, I think, signals a changing population within Franklin County. So what have you learned about your students and what are you looking forward to in terms of using that to build thriving communities in your region? Absolutely, it's great to see you Liz and great to be here with everyone and to see so many of my colleagues. Uh, thank you for the invitation and here in rural Massachusetts, we appreciate the board and the commissioner's uh, commitment to equity. The financial support that we've gotten from Lumina is already opening many doors for students and enhancing our communities in ways that go even beyond what we had originally anticipated. Franklin County, as you may know, um, is the poorest county in Massachusetts. And uh, so our commitment to equity encompasses the racial dimension, certainly, the social, the gender, the gender identity, and of course, the economic dimensions of equity. And nationally, one of the things that we know is that rural students' college attendance rate fall be below that of urban students. So we are very concerned about the rate of college going and college completion for our students. And as you mentioned, Liz, one of the things that we are seeing is that the current population of middle and high school students from which we draw is much more diverse today than it was even five years ago. And the pipeline for the rest of the decade is even more diverse. We are seeing that change, that racial change. And at the same time, we are seeing that Gen Z and Gen Alpha are coming to us with a heightened sense of consciousness around equity for themselves and for their peers. We, and we are learning as a result of that to be very conscious, not just about the equitable outcomes, but also about the need to invest in the qualitative experiences of students and to design curricula and pedagogy that take into account their lived experiences. So this means operationalizing and living our mission, our values, our vision uh, for a more just and equitable world where everyone can fully participate as a citizen and as an agent of our economic well-being uh, for the state. So we are living these values in ways that give voice to all of our students and at the same time in working with the um, consortium with uh, Dr. Gentle uh, Warrior over at uh, BSU and the consortium, the larger consortium, we are also learning that we need to support the faculty and staff engaged in this work. It is laborious work and we have uh, not just resources to support them, but also we have caucuses to support our black and brown faculty engaging in supporting our students, as well as our white ally faculty and staff who are also engaging in this world. So our perception is that we need to bring everyone together. We need to acknowledge everyone's experiences, approach this work with humility and understand that we, all, we are all striving towards the same goal. We will make mistakes, um, but we will learn from those mistakes and support one another. Thank you so much. Uh, last but not least, welcome back to Massachusetts, Chancellor Suarez Orozco. We were delighted you're here and would love to close with your perspectives about the newest, as the newest campus leader here, what excites you about UMass Boston, its student population, and, and what are some of the early opportunities you see for UMass Boston to play a role in this effort to promote racial equity on campus and across the system? Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Liz. I'm so happy and moved. Uh, to join this important, I would say, essential conversation. I'm grateful to Commissioner Santiago. Muchas gracias. I'm, I'm so grateful to Lumina for once again being at the forefront of a defining issue of our times. I would like to echo and um, briefly elaborate on President San Juan Fernandez's mm -hmm. reflections on the demographic transition that she's seeing. Uh, because this is the defining demographic feature uh, of our commonwealth, uh, of our country, and uh, indeed what we're seeing in, in Boston, in the, in the commonwealth, uh, throughout the United States, is a demographic feature uh, that now is increasingly 
it characterizes every high and middle income country in the world. The only sector of the child and youth population growing is the children of color. Uh, the data on this are, uh, uh, are, are very, very clear. Um, we now in the Commonwealth and with the brilliant and visionary support of the Lumina Foundation uh, need to endeavor to do something that no high income country in the history of the world has done well. And that is connecting with and ease in the transition of this, the most diverse cohort of young people of, of color in the history of uh, our Commonwealth, in the history of our country. Uh, I moved uh, to the Commonwealth from <coughs> the, the West Coast. Uh, today, uh, our Western uh, states are facing the most extraordinary demographic transition, mimicking what we see in the Commonwealth. The only sector growing is the children of color. Without a happy future for this, the most diverse cohort of young people in the Commonwealth's history, there cannot be a happy future for the Commonwealth. They are our citizens. Uh, one of my colleagues echoed the eternal words of the great Horace Mann. They are the citizens of the Commonwealth. In order for them to flourish, in order for them to become the next generation of, of scientists, of, of, um, uh, of uh, uh, lawyers and engineers and nurses and, and, and firemen and firewomen, we need to connect. This is the defining feature and the world is looking at Boston and the world is looking at the Commonwealth as one of our colleagues, I, I believe the, the, our, um, uh, Dr. Howard uh, commented. Let me give you some data that should take your breath away. This morning, 40% of the children that got up in Berlin, Germany, come from non-German immigrant and refugee origin homes of color. Two thirds of the children in Rotterdam, Amsterdam, and The Hague that woke up this morning, got into bikes to go to schools, are non-Dutch, children of color, children of refugees, children of immigrant. Their future, like the future of our children of color, will determine the capacity of these, of the promise of liberal democracies to engage all our citizens in the making and the remaking of the promise of the practice of democratic citizenship. The racialization of inequality is invading every domain of economy and society, not only in our city and in our commonwealth, in our country, but we see this as a phenomenon being repeated the world over. The racialization of inequality is the gravest threat now to the practice of democratic citizenship in our city, in our commonwealth, in our country. It is an existential challenge to undo the racialized structures of inequality and channeling the great Horace Mann and the great John Dewey. It is education. It is edu the practice of education, first and foremost, embodying the ideals of, democratic, of the democratic promise that will, be, that will make the journey towards a more just, a more humane, a more dignified life for all our citizens possible. I don't know of any other instrument other than education, other than higher education as the tool to begin the journey to a more equitable, to a more humane, society. It's the call of justice. It is also, as the demographics suggest, the only pathway to a happy future for all our citizens. I am grateful to the commissioner. I am grateful to you, Liz, and to these extraordinary uh, colleagues um, uh, for uh, allowing us at UMass Boston to be a part of this existential conversation for the future of our country. Thank you. Well, 
Thank you, and thank you all. I look forward to learning alongside of you and learning more about the interesting work. But we are a little bit over, so at this point, I'd like to just say thank you for all that you're doing.